Thank you very much. So first, I would like to thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to this very nice uh, workshop. Uh, I hope everybody can hear me. Normally, it's usually not a problem. Uh, and I wanted to thank everybody who made it despite the holiday and the adverse atmospheric conditions. I've been uh, asked to do a tutorial on uh, Wendy systems, so I will uh, try to go slow. If there is any question, any thing you want to ask, don't hesitate, uh, shout, interrupt me. I've prepared a five hours talk anyway, so uh, no, no, more seriously. Uh, I've put more material than I will cover during the, the talk, but there are other slides so people can find informations on the slides on things I will not uh, tell you about. And before I start, okay, here is a, is a photograph of the, of the group, a very recent photograph of the group in Geneva. Uh, one person that you recognize is Michele Filippone, who is here participating to this workshop. Uh, and I would like to seize the occasion before, because then I will probably not reach this part during the talk, to make an advertisement for his poster. Uh, if you want to know what this weird uh, uh, drawing is, about, I recommend you to go and see the poster and uh, chat with Michele uh, on, the, on the topic of ladders under mag magnetic field. Okay, so let me uh, go back to the uh, issue of transport in uh, one-dimensional systems. So let's say transport in general. So why do we do transport? It's because usually it gives information on the internal excitations of our system, the physics of our system, and that's probably one of the simplest experiments that one can do in condensed matter. As you saw from the talk of Jean-Philippe, it's not so simple to do it in other fields like uh, cold atoms. But in condensed matter, we all did this type of experiment, and that's very easy to measure that this is a conductor or an insulator, and you hope to gain information on what is uh, making the system tick by measuring the transport. It's also one of the simplest out of equilibrium situation that one has to deal with. Uh, it's a steady state, usually out of equilibrium situation. And we deal with this usually by cheating, by going to linear response and assuming that the voltage you apply is very weak and therefore you can analyze the thing in equilibrium. Of course, it's never, uh, it's not always true. Uh, but this is uh, one cheat that we do most of the time. And in many, many, many cases, we sort of have a very hydrodynamic approach. Uh, we say we have three particles and we write a Boltzmann equation with a scattering rate. So in a way, we consider that we have a lifetime and the lifetime is con controlling the transport property. And again, this is, of course, not uh, true. And the interesting cases are usually uh, when this thing is not true. Now, why do I want to talk about transport in one dimension? It's because one dimension is very special by many, many points. The first thing is that contrarily to 2D and above, where particles, even if they are strongly interacting, retain some degree of individuality, this particle repels the other but can still move as more or less uh, 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 an isolated particle. This is for fermions what goes under the name of lambda or quasi-particles. If you are in one dimension and you queue in a line, you all know very well that individual excitations do not exist and everything is transformed into a collective motion. You cannot move if the person in front of you or behind you is moving and you know also this very well with the cars. If you're in a lane, you, this car cannot move as an individual. It has to follow the car before and so on. And therefore the whole lane moves, not one individual. So so in 1D, there is a kind of collectivization of excitations, which will make, sorry, I will move this a little bit, not to step on it. Uh, this will make the uh, uh, nature of the systems very, very different from what we are used to in 2D or 3D. The second thing is that in 1D, there are usually extremely strong fluctuations due to quantumness or to some extent temperature, and this kills most of the theoretical tools that we are used to and we love, like mean field theory, where we say, oh, I have a wave function, it has a phase, but the phase acquires an average value, like in a superfluid, for example, and we expand around this, uh, this uh, average value. Uh, in 1D, it will not work because quantum fluctuations will destroy the average value. So you have to find other tools, other theoretical tools uh, to deal with such
such situations. It's very difficult to order, and as a result, the, the systems will be a little bit special. So these two features and some others that I will mention later make when this system having very weird or very special transport properties compared to their higher dimensional counterpart and something which deserves to be studied uh, in its own right. Now, of course, doing an overview on transport in Wendy is a gigantic subject, so there is no chance I'm going to cover uh, all this uh, in, uh, in this one-hour tutorial. So I can immediately tell you things that I won't talk about and uh, for two reasons. A, I had to make choices. B, some of these things I myself didn't do so much contributions in, so I, of course, naturally decided to, to choose other topics. So, for example, I won't talk about chiral edge states in quantum Hall effect or topological insulators. Uh, you heard many uh, talks already on how to measure transport current along an edge state. This is chiral 1D systems. Unfortunately, this is a very interesting subject, but I won't have time to talk about it during this talk. I won't talk also about some form of transport where uh, you have, for example, one quantum particle, a massive quantum particle, that could move in a 1D bath and interact with a lot of other degrees of freedom. And this is a very interesting topic which has been reactivated recently in particular thanks to cold atom which can realize this. You take a, a potassium atom in a bath of rubidium atom. Uh, there are very beautiful things to say about this. Uh, we did some uh, work on this, but uh, I won't have time to talk about it. I won't say anything about energy transport, so thermoelectricity and so on. Uh, this is uh, next level of enlightenment, if I can say. Uh, I will concentrate already on charge transport. Uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, complicated enough for this talk, but there are clearly very, very interesting things to do and which have been done, of course, uh, in the literature on energy transport, but I won't say a word about it. And of course, I will stick during this tutorial mostly to linear response. Well, not mostly, totally to linear response. So I won't say something about nonlinear response of when these systems quenches strictly serious out of equilibrium situation. So that's the, the, the border or the boundary condition of what I'm going to tell in this uh, tutorial. Now, I will also go very fast on the theory aspect. So many of you are already familiar with uh, Wendy theory. There are a lot of experts already in the, in the room, but I will kind of uh, take the approach then a miracle occurs. Uh, I won't be more explicit in step two. So if you want to know more on this, here is a list of various references uh, where you can find probably even more details than you care about uh, on the various aspects of Wendy system. So this ranges from a, a very, uh, I would say, uh, exhaustive reference, which is a book on Wendy systems, to more recent reviews or uh, um, short reviews on various aspects of Wendy system. So you will get this uh, in, the, in the slide. Okay, so what happens in Wendy? If I had to give a 101 crash course on Wendy physics, well, what is different between Wendy and 3D fermions, for example? Well, in Wendy, you have only collective excitations, and uh, this gentleman, uh, Duncan Aldane, who received the Nobel Prize for other things, but who could have easily also gotten it for this uh, thing showed that there is in one dimension a universal concept which is a little bit the equivalent of Fermi liquid theory in a higher dimension which he called the Tomonaga Latinga liquid concept which I think should have been called Haldane liquid but okay uh, and there are a set of universal low energy properties in in Wendy and let me just explain very briefly uh, and I won't go in the derivation but I will just show you formulas that should guide you in this ID. So in one dimension, you can introduce a collective variable, which I call phi, which you can use to describe density fluctuations. And this is a remarkable formula that is written here, which writes the density, which is, if you think about it, an extremely singular operator. Density is a set of delta functions at the place where there are the particles. So it goes from infinity to zero at a distance which is much smaller than the distance between particles. So technically, you should not be able to do any hydrodynamic description of the density. It's something which varies too fast at the scale of the distance between particles. But using this representation, using this collective variable, 
you can do an hydrodynamic description where you re-express the density, which is, again, a very singular operator, in terms of a smooth variable, which can vary very slowly at the scale of the lattice spacing, at the interparticle distance, and for which you can do a continuous description, which, of course, will help you a lot in the writing effective low-energy uh, theory. So you can view this expression as a kind of Fourier decomposition of the density. If I retain the term p equals zero, this says that the density is the divergence of this field phi, and this is the hydrodynamic expression. This is what you read in landau lifshitz on elasticity. So you can think about phi as the displacement compared to an equilibrium position in a crystal. If you want this phi yield is up to a factor, the distance between the uh, perfect position that particle will occupy in a crystal and the actual position they occupy. So p equals zero is the hydrodynamic term. If I concentrate the particle on a point, I can reinforce locally the density. But you see also that there are higher harmonics, which corresponds to p equal one, p equal two, which correspond to a density wave of this particle, which you can shift altogether by changing phi. So you move the delta function peaks. So you change the density, but uh, it's not something that is smooth at the scale of the lattice spacing, but which really describe with my poor drawing skills in PowerPoint, this should be a cosine, which describe a density wave, a charge density wave, which uh, has been shifted by this phi. So this expression is extremely useful because again, phi is a slowly varying field, which will allow for an hydrodynamic description. And of course, there are all the higher harmonics, which help you reconstruct delta functions at the place of the particle. Now, if you have a field phi, uh, you, this is the density, but we all know that the wave function has also a phase. So there is another field theta, which is, let's say, let me take bosons, for example. So there is a field theta, which is describing the phase of the wave function. It just turns out that the commutation relation of the single particle operators impose that phi and theta are essentially conjugate variables. If you want to satisfy psi dig of psi, commutator is one, you need that theta and grad phi, or phi and grad theta by integration by part, is a delta function. So this field phi and theta are conjugate, and for superconductors, this is translating the well-known duality between number of particle and phase of a superconductor that you know, but this is something which is much more generic in 1D and which is valid at the operator level. So you can use these two phases, the superfluid phase and the density phase, to build an effective low energy Hamiltonian, and I will not show the derivation, but trust me on that, you can take your favorite microscopic Hamiltonian, Hubbard, Boz Hubbard, whatever, and at the end of the day, you will always end up on this, which is an harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian, where you get a term which is grad phi square, you immediately see grad phi, the density contains grad phi. So rho square, which is the interaction, is grad phi square. So the interaction will enter into this term immediately. And this term here, pi, is grad theta. It's the conjugate phase to phi. So this term, you can think of it as grad theta square, and that's just the kinetic energy of the problem. So this is something which is, uh, you can easily write. But what is interesting is you can write it for an interacting system, which means you can reduce 1D interacting system to a bunch of harmonic oscillators, which means you can solve. So in one line, I solve for you all 1D interacting quantum systems. Well, caricaturing a little bit, but that's not completely wrong. And the interactions are hidden in these two coefficients. One is the sound velocity, u, and the other is one dimensionless parameter, which people call the tomonaga lattinger liquid parameter, and which varies depending on the interaction. So for example, for a Bose-Hubbard model with a repulsion, so fermions on the Latin, uh, sorry, bosons, uh, with a contact interaction, so let's say Lieblininger model in the continuum, where the interaction is going from zero to infinity, the Lattinger parameter is going from actually infinity when there are no repulsion. As I told you, this term is coming from interaction, rho square, so when there is no interaction, k is infinity, this term drops out. And when the repulsion is getting larger and larger, k is decreasing and ending at k equal one, for uh, infinitely repulsive bosons, which in 1D is the same thing than free spinless fermions, and k equal one is the hallmark of non-interacting particles. So just to show you, you can do this. Now, 
Since you have a quadratic Hamiltonian, you can compute all the correlations. So let me show you correlations in 1D. This is the single particle correlation function for bosons. It decays as a power law, and this power is controlled by this exponent k. The density-density correlation has a q equals zero part, so y is the time, essentially. It's tau square, if you want. Uh, and r is square root of tau square plus x square. And so it has a part which is non-oscillating, but because of the higher harmonics, it has a part which is oscillating with an oscillation 2 pi rho zero, and this decays as a power law with a non-universal exponent which depends on k. So you see that this parameter k controls the decay of all the correlation functions in 1D. And you also see that the 1D system is essentially critical. It's a little bit like the system doesn't know where it should order, whether it should become a superfluid or a crystal, and both have quasi-long range order. And of course, which one wins depends on the value of k. If k is very large, repulsion between the bosons is weak, this decays very slowly, this decays very fast. So you would say it's more a superfluid than a crystal. If k is very small, this decays very slowly, this decays very fast, this decays very slowly. So you would say my bosons have nearly crystallized. And so, but you see the system is critical. It has quasi long range order in both directions. So here is a kind of pseudo phase diagram. By pseudo phase diagram, I mean I plot the correlation that decays the more slowly. And uh, at k equal one half, there is this crossover between a system dominated by superfluidity and a system which would be dominated by charge density wave correlation. So one can do a very complete study, a very nice study of the low energy properties of one dimensional systems. Now low energy sometimes is not enough. And one of the beautiful things that I won't have time to talk during this talk in 1D is that in the last 15 years or so, there were tremendous theoretical progress in other directions. So field theory itself made progress, but numerics made tremendous progress with, in particular, DMRG and related methods, which now allow you to get time-dependent finite temperature correlation function. And even the venerable better than that solution for exactly solvable model has now the capability for some very specific cases to compute the correlation functions, which was something you know, which was unheard of uh, 20 years ago. I would say uh, 30 years ago, what people in better than that could tell you, they could tell you if the model was exactly solvable. That's it. We know that this model we can solve. But what is the solution? I don't know. I know I can solve it. No, I'm joking. They knew much more. Actually, the gap in the Hubbard model was shown for the first time by Better on that. And the Lieblininger model, which is this model, was comp computed for the first time by Better on that by Elliot Lieb in particular. But I just want to point out that there were this tremendous progress. And now these three type of methods, the numerics, the field theory, and the Better on that, are working together to be able to give a description at all scales of the of the, the the Wendy systems. I will confine to the field theory description because that's the one which is of course usually the most easy and also because it's very relevant for transport that I'm going to discuss. You can do the same thing for spins. I won't discuss too much. Here are the expression of the operators in terms of this field theta and phi. And lo and behold, if you have a spin chain, you can compute the correlation function of the spins, and they show the same non-universal power law decay with decay controlled by the Luttinger liquid exponents uh, in this way. So this is simple. You have your quadratic Hamiltonian. You just compute the correlations, and you can get everything you want. Uh, isotropic Eisenberg, for example, corresponds to k equal 1 half. And you see that if you put k equal 1 half, you recover a decay as 1 over r for the correlation, the antiferromagnetic correlation functions, which is what you know by other uh, techniques. You can also do same thing with fermions. Uh, if you have fermions, the expression for the density is slightly different. Uh, you notice that the number here in the exponent is uh, odd instead of being even, as it was for bosons. And this uh, traduces the fact that for fermions, you're, you have low energy excitation around something which oscillates, which is either plus kf or minus kf, which, if I translate in density, is pi rho zero or minus pi rho zero. And this is describing the oscillations when p is equal to zero, 
This is oscillating at plus Kf. When P is equal to minus 1, this is oscillating at minus Kf, and you recover the right and left movers that you, accept, you expect for one-dimensional systems. Again, if I compute the density-density correlation, I get uh, power. Okay, so we have this, uh, if I compute, for example, the n of k using this expression, I find that the jump that I usually get for Fermi liquids, the discontinuity that you get at the Fermi surface, which is the characteristics of the existence of lambda quasi-particle, does not exist. There are no single particle excitations that exist in Wendy, but it's replaced by a power law singularity with an exponent which is again controlled by this uh, tomonaga lottinger liquid parameter. So, okay, so that's a kind of crash course on the physics of 1D systems uh, that, of course, we, we will use uh, to, to study transport. I want to point out another phenomenon, which is the rule in 1D, and which is more the exception in higher dimension, which is that the excitations tend to fractionalize. What do I mean by that? Let me write here a little chain of electrons which carry their charge and their spin, and let me make the experiment by removing one particle. When I do this, this is normally the most elementary excitation I should be able to do. I remove an electron, and therefore I remove a charge, and I remove a spin one half. Now, what happens in the system is that the particle will flip, the, the spin will flip because of the magnetic exchange, and therefore after a while I will get in a region of the system a part which contains no charge missing, but for which I have clearly spin which has been disturbed. So I have an excitation here which carries a spin but no charge. And this is what people call a spin-on. And what is remarkable is that the excitation of charge can move very far away. It's not confined in any way to the other excitation. It can move very far away, and therefore in another part of the system, I can have an excitation that carries a charge but you see that the spin is not disturbed up, down, up, down, up, down around this excitation. So this is what people call a holon, and this excitation carries a charge but no spin. So in Wendy, very naturally, excitation you think elementary, minimal, will break down into collective excitations which carry only part of the quantum number. And of course, as you immediately imagine, this will have drastic consequence for the transport because if the charge can separate from the spin, the transport will be entirely dominated by what the holon do and doesn't care about what the spin on do. So this is very different from 2D or 3D where if you want to move something, it will have to be a quasi-particle which will carry both its charge and its spin. Now you could tell me why doesn't it happen in higher dimension. We can do the same drawing with uh, many chains. So, of course, these are cartoons, but one can do serious calculations to, to show this. So let me remove the particle as I did. Let me go blah blah, do the, 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 the tilt and blah blah blah. So I have my, my spin on here. Then I let the other particle move. I have my hole on there. But you see what happens. If I have other chains, if I have other surroundings, then this region here has wrongly ordered spins. So I have an energy cost that will grow with the distance between the spin-on and the hole-on. So they are confined. I have a very strong spring that keeps them together. So I have a bound state between spin-on and hole-on, and this bound state, you better call it a lambda quasi-particle, and that's your original particle. So this deconfinement, at least this form of deconfinement, does not occur in higher dimension. Yes. So you have confinement also for two-coupled chains? So you have a form of confinement for two-coupled chains. Of course, for two-coupled chains, you can go to symmetric and anti-symmetric variables. And so the symmetric variable is not confined. So if you go to many chains, you get only one mode that could be 1D over n minus 1 modes that are uh, uh, collective. And that's what you get also in a Fermi liquid when you go to the Fermi liquid, you always have one collective mode of charge and one collective mode of spins, but all the rest are single particle excitations. While in 1D, the collective modes, they exhaust all the spectrum. So you're, you're right. You, you would get this form of confinement also with two chains. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so that's all what I wanted to say. So now, uh, after this lengthy introduction, let's move to the transport. And uh, so, well, you can use the same technology. So let me uh, take transport 
uh, I want to compute the current. The current in 1D is essentially the number of right particle minus the number of left particle times the velocity. If I consider a spectrum which is linear, I will mostly discuss the case of fermions. And this is very simple to relate to these fields. This is the field I call phi, which is sort of the time derivative of this variable uh, omega. So if I want to compute the conductivity, at the end, the Kubo formula becomes remarkably simple. It's omega times the Green's function of the phi's. So this is omega times the phi phi correlation. And you can, of course, as usual, write the conductivity as a, a Drude peak with a certain weight plus a regular part, which will tend to a finite value when omega goes to zero. And because of the technology I showed you before, you can immediately show that the weight of the Drude peak here at zero temperature is just the product u time k. So if you have a, a Luttinger liquid, as I showed, then you always have a delta function at omega equals zero, whose weight is given by u times k. I'm not saying the system is a superfluid. I'm just saying it conducts perfectly the, the current uh, with this thing. And you can also uh, relay this to persistent currents uh, and compute. So there are various tricks to compute. In particular, there is a method that was introduced initially by Goetze and Wolfler, which is called the memory function, which in high dimension is not so useful compared to other methods, which, which is remarkably useful in one dimension. So this is a very nice way to rewrite the conductivity. It's a kind of hydrodynamic approximation, which allows you to rewrite the conductivity as a function of this memory function. If this was just i divided by tau, tau would be the lifetime. So this would give you a Lorentzian conductivity in frequency. This would be the standard Drude formula. Of course, in 1D, m of omega is more complicated than just a constant, uh, and therefore you get uh, more uh, funny behavior. So this memory function is connected to a correlation uh, of the commutator of the current with the Hamiltonian, and is extremely useful because it incorporates all the vertex corrections, which in 1D are extremely uh, needed because it's not the same thing if you have a scattering process that let you continue forward, it doesn't change the current, or a process which makes you jump backward, which completely affects the current. So in 1D, contrary to a higher dimension, vertex corrections are absolutely crucial uh, uh, to take into account. And of course, this method is a kind of hydrodynamic approach, so it has its own uh, limitation. So let me take an example, and uh, this is the one on which I would like to uh, maybe spend a little bit of time, uh, the, which is the case of the periodic lattice. Now, what I showed were particles in the continuum. I didn't have any periodic potential put on it, but now I will add a periodic potential on my particles. And if I do this, I can also treat it by bosonization, by the technique I showed before. Yeah, it's called bosonization. It should have been called collectivization, but I think it carried out some uh, uh, not so nice uh, thing. And initially, people did it to show that you could re-express fermions in terms of collective bosonic excitations. But actually, as Aldane showed, you can also take bosons and re-express them in terms of collective bosonic excitation. So bosonization, that's an urban legend, is not made to transform fermions into bosons. It's made to transform single particle excitations into collective excitation. And it works for fermions, for spins, and for bosons. So this is a very generic method. Okay, so let me say I put my periodic potential. I have my density. I use the magic formula I showed you before. And there you see there is something very special that happens if Q is equal to pi rho zero, which means that you have a potential with exactly one particle per minimum of the potential, because now the oscillation cancels. And uh, let's forget the incommensurate case. And then if you're commensurate, you get an additional term, which is a nice cosine that appears in the Hamiltonian. So you go to something which will have a competition between the quadratic part, which now I write as an action here, which is something which we like this phase phi to fluctuate. And I apologize, this phi is the same than this phi. Uh, I'm a victim of word uh, equation editor. Uh, so this term would like phi to fluctuate. This is what gives the Luttinger liquid properties that I mentioned before. But this periodic term wants phi to be locked, to be equal to 0 or 2 pi or 4 pi and so on. So there will be, as you can expect, a phase transition where in one case the phase phi will be locked to the minima 
And the other case, the phase phi can fluctuate. And this transition is actually exactly a Berezinsky costless starless phase transition. And in this language, it occurs exactly at k equal to. So this is a well-known Hamiltonian, which is known as the sine gordon Hamiltonian, and which will describe all the properties of 1D particles in a periodic potential. Uh, there is a string order parameter, but let me skip this. Uh, I don't want to go too much in details, but you can really make the connection very precise between this object here, which is this cosine, and the vortex operator that appears in berezinsky costelis starless uh, transition. You can check that this cosine is creating a vortex of 2 pi in the dual phase theta. So this is an operator which creates a vortex in the dual phase. And if you want to make the analogy, K is a little bit like the inverse of the temperature in, in the BKT, and G is the vortex fugacity. So as a result of this quantum phase transition, you can write phase diagrams where you have a, a commensurate phase where the phase phi is locked, and uh, an incommensurate phase if you put a chemical potential where the, the phase phi is unlocked. So you get a, a, a commensurate phase surrounded by Luttinger liquid. And of course, this describes, for example, the Mott insulating transition for bosons. And this has been tested in DMRG uh, uh, calculations. And there is perfect agreement between the prediction of the field theory and the, uh, and the uh, numerics. OK. Now, it not only it has been tested in numerics, but it has been tested in experiments. They were, in particular, pioneering experiment by the group of Hans Christoph Nagel in Innsbruck, where he took bosons with the delta function interactions, which can be, uh, let's say, adapted. OK, here it, the interaction is changed with a slightly different trick than the one that Jean-Philippe told you. But essentially, it took particles and put them in a very weak periodic lattice and then try to see for which value of the lattice potential versus the strength of the interaction. So the interaction is increasing when you move here. It's 1 over the interaction, which is plotted. Where do you get the transition between the superfluid and the commensurate phase, the Mott insulator? And lo and behold, you see that it converges for a very weak lattice to a very specific value of the interaction. In this experiment, it was difficult to nail down the value. But there were more recent experiments done in the group of Giovanni Modugno in Florence. Um, and we contributed uh, uh, on the theoretical analysis of this experiment together with a group of Laurent Sanchez Palencia from the Institute of TIC. And there they can do a very precise determination of the value here, which is what happens when the strength of the uh, small lattice is going to zero. So you see that here the system is a superfluid. And when you pass this magic value, it becomes a commensurate phase. And lo and behold, this magic value, because you know all the system and whatever, you can reconvert into the Latinger parameter. And it gives you exactly the transition where you expect it, which is at k equal 2. So this is a, a beautiful test, if you want, of if it was needed, uh, of a berezinsky costelis starless transition, showing the universal value at the transition of the thing. Uh, let me skip the non-local uh, topological order. Let's go to conductivity. So what happened for conductivity? Well, I can use my, my memory function formalism. I have the commutator of the current with the Hamiltonian, which is this way. Let's forget about the incommensurability here. Delta is equal to 0. Here is my memory function. It's a d gamma product of d gamma function, blah, blah, blah. And here is the result. So if you're incommensurate you will find that there is a delta function peak. The system is metallic, if you want. But then there is a power law, which is dependent on the frequency, uh, and which uh, the power depends on the Luttinger liquid parameter. If I am in the commensurate phase, then I have a gap in the excitation spectrum. So I have a Mott insulator. I don't get any transport up to the point where the frequency is able to excite particle across the gap. And then I get a kind of Paolo optical absorption with, again, a Paolo, which depends on the, um, on the uh, uh, Luttinger parameter. One can do a better job by combining RG and the memory function. And essentially, this is what, what is the, the predicted transport. Now, this can be tested. Uh, here is an experiment that was done by Martin Dressel, Leo De Giorgi, and George Gruner on organic uh, conductors, which are a good realization of a commensurate uh, system. Uh, these are molecules which are stacked on the top of each other. So although the compound is 3D, 
the electronic motion is on the direction of the chain. And here is the measured optical conductivity. So you see that for various compounds, uh, TM, TSF, PF6, SF6, and so on, you see this uh, sort of uh, uh, reasonably similar uh, curve. And if you plot this curve, you very clearly see a power law over more than one decade, which is a good confirmation that this uh, TLL theory is working very well. And to the best of my knowledge, this experiment was the first uh, proof of uh, TLL behavior uh, in, a fermionic, uh, in a fermionic system, uh, and this was done thanks to transport. Okay, now these are uh, all the story. This is la last century story. Let's try to be more quantitative, and uh, you already heard uh, part of the story from, uh, from Jean-Philippe. Uh, let's try to see if with cold atoms we can do a very uh, controlled comparison between the theory and the, um, and the experiment. And as Jean-Philippe was explaining to you, one can realize big reservoirs, a 1D tube, and a periodic lattice, which is superimposed on this uh, 1D tube. And that got, uh, start, got uh, started with a very nice collaboration between the, the group of Jean-Philippe and Tillman and Slinger. So here you, you see them. Martin Lebras was the person who was uh, sort of uh, driving the, the, the experiment. And on the theory side, the theory was done by Piotr Grissins, who was a postdoc in, uh, in my group at the time. And so we tried to see whether we could interpret their uh, experiment. So I will not uh, re recall what uh, Jean-Philippe has said. They can put a periodic lattice. Unfortunately for the theories, the lattice is a little bit more complicated than just a nice sinusoid, but okay, one has to live with that. Nobody's perfect, as uh, one uh, was uh, saying. Uh, so for non-interacting particles, this is uh, very simple because there you can use landauer butiker formula. You know very well the potential, so you can compute the transmission. And if you do this, you can, uh, for each energy, uh, okay, here is the schematic version of the potential, but one can do it with a real version of the potential. You can check whether a wave is transmitted or not transmitted through the structure. And lo and behold, you find that there is this dip that Jean-Philippe was mentioning when you change the gate potential, which is a laser which controls the density in the structure. You go from no particle, then a partial filling of the band where the conductance is getting good. Then you reach the commensurability condition. You get the band insulator. And of course, because the temperature is disastrous, it's one-tenth of the Fermi energy. This is not, you know, I mean, you have to realize that for condensed matter people, it means 1,000 Kelvin experiment. I mean, it's an experiment where you melt the lab, the sample, everything usually. But because the interaction is so high in their system when they want to, this is experiment which can still probe very efficiently the quantum nature of things. So this is something one has to appreciate that the scales are very different, but nevertheless, uh, one can do extremely nice tests of quantum physics uh, in this system. So here you get the band insulator. And, uh, okay, here is the data. You already saw it with uh, Jean-Philippe's talk. So the question is, what happens if I put attractive interactions and the weak periodic lattice? So again, we can use the technology. <coughs> of course, if I have attraction, I would imagine that I have a singlet superconductor. And, of course, you would imagine, oh, superconductor, it's resistant to scattering. So it doesn't care if I have a little periodic potential on it. And actually... Uh, you would thus expect a competition between a band insulator if the interaction is zero and, of course, a superconductor if the interaction is very large. And the periodic potential should not play a role. And this is very well confirmed by a nice paper by Nozier and Pistolesi. Well, they had in mind high TC at the time, but let me ignore this, where they looked at a mean field model where they put both a periodic potential and a BCS attraction uh, in a system. And lo and behold, you find that when you increase the BCS gap, the band gap is dropping to zero. The BCS gap is opening. So you go from a band insulator to a superconductor. And that's what is the very natural uh, intuition that you would get. And, of course, the question is, is this always true? And uh, uh, how can we test? So the test, this is Jean-Philippe's experiment. That's, it's there. They just have this knob. They turn it, and they switch on the attraction up to infinity. Uh, theoretically, we can compute what happens in 1D. So we have our uh, bosons in the, uh, fermions, so 
in the continuum. This is what is known as the godin yang model. Uh, but we can bosonize, as I was explaining. We have the lattice. We use the bosonization. We get a charge sector. We get a spin sector, uh, which is the sum. The charge sector is row up plus row down. The spin sector is row up minus row down. But because of these collective variables, they completely decouple, as we uh, saw by my little cartoon. The holons are going their way. The spin-ons are going their way. At the Hamiltonian level, it means that the charge sector is completely decoupled from the spin sector. The spin sector is a sine Gordon Hamiltonian with a cosine which depends on the attraction here. And the charge sector, the attraction is normally only entering in this coefficient VCKC. But of course, we have the periodic lattice potential that has been imposed on the experiment. So this time, this potential will change things. So uh, here is the density. OK, for fermions, one has to worry about also the 4KF oscillations. I don't want to go too much in details. We can compute, because they know so well their system, we can compute all these parameters from the microscopic knowledge that they give us from their Hamiltonian. So we know what VC is. We know what KC is very precisely, because they know their interaction very precisely. They can tell us we have this scattering length. And therefore, uh, we can say, oh, you have this value of VC and KC. And this type of Hamiltonian has been studied since a long time ago in the 70s by the two gentlemen you briefly saw the image and is known as a Luther Emery liquid. Because you see that what, what will happen if I don't have this periodic potential, the charge sector is massless, but the spin sector will acquire a gap. The spin sector will develop a gap. So this is not a Luttinger liquid. This is something different. And people call it the Luther Emery liquid. So here is Alan Luther and the late uh, Vic Emery. And you get a gap in the spin sector, which you can think of as the singlet pairing of the two particles. And now what is the resulting object? The resulting object is a kind of bosons, which is described by the charge sector. And the main difference between uh, what happens in 1D and what happens in higher dimension is now these bosons, they will themselves spin on the periodic potential that you put. And as I showed you before, it works very efficiently. So these bosons, which are the Cooper pair, if you want, but even very weakly bounded Cooper pair, Cooper pair which can be 10,000 lattice spacing apart, they will pin on the lattice potential. So this is a very unusual property. So how do we study the transport? You add a gradient term uh, of the field phi rho, uh, phi charge to the Hamiltonian. So now your Hamiltonian is, uh, uh, so let me skip this. So now you have to solve an equation of motion which contains the quadratic part, the cosines which are describing the lattice potential. This is coming from the quadratic part. And you have the electric field that induces the transport. So we have to solve this equation of motion. This is a semi-classical approximation. This is not the full quantum solution, but it's good enough for the, the purpose, especially, again, at temperatures which are one-tenth of the Fermi energy. This is a very good approximation. So we do it. The reason why we do this is because this potential is not a nice sinusoidal potential, but a little bit more complicated. So we solve this equation. We put thermal noise under the form of stochastic noise at the edge in the region which is away from the uh, uh, region where the potential is existing. And lo and behold, when you, uh, when you solve, you see the curves that Jean-Philippe already showed you, which show the clear minimum, marked minimum, at a very special value of the local density, which corresponds essentially to two particles per site. And of course, you can convert into chemical potential, but I think uh, on the theory side, it's more nice to see that you get this thing. So you get an insulator. And what is remarkable is that this insulator will persist even if you crank up the attraction between particles up to infinity. And this is what these gentlemen see. Here is the curve of their conductance. And you notice that they go from, let's say, no interactions, very small uh, attraction, to infinite attraction, and nothing changes. They see the same curve. So either they forgot to plug a, a, a wire in their experiment. When they turn the knob, actually nothing changes. Oh, Philippe is looking at me. You know. <laughs> no, so they didn't forget to put, a, to put a wire in their experiment. So this is the first experimental proof 
of the existence of this Lutheran reliquid, which you, know, you cannot simply test in condensed matter because you have no system with an attractive contact interaction in uh, condensed matter. So this is a nice thing. OK, now I have 11 uh, minutes left, essentially. So uh, I'll skip the disorder part. I would have loved to tell you about what happens when you look at transport into disordered system. There are beautiful questions on the combined effect of disorder and interactions in Wendy. But I will skip this part. Uh, and I'll go directly. So you will find it on the, as I, I knew I would have to make a choice. So I, you will find this on the, on the slides. There are beautiful uh, things that one can, uh, can uh, ask for disordered systems. One can compute the transport and so on. Uh, and uh, I will sort of go back to uh, some questions which are much more open, which is what happens. After all, I told you things in 1D. So I put periodic lattice. I can put disorder. Fine. But what happens if I'm not in 1D? If I'm with a ladder, as you were saying, or three chains, or four chains, or an infinite number of chains. Are there interesting questions on transport, or we, do we go back to doing Boltzmann equations uh, like, in, uh, like in 3D? Well, the first thing is that this is largely open physics, and this is very difficult to treat, because you lose the analytics, you lose the numerics, uh, and you're, 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 you're stuck. Uh, but one can, can do, you have also, of course, to worry about spin-orbit coupling, potentially, magnetic field effects, so I will mention a couple of uh, examples. And most of the studies, so far, have happily lived with no, no interactions. And of course, that's much more easy to diagonalize a 2 by 2 matrix than to diagonalize a 2 to the n by 2 to the n matrix, especially when n is 10 to the 23. So this is why it's much more easy to deal with this issue for non-interactive. But of course, if you want to deal with many experimental systems, you have to worry about interaction. So let me flash a couple of issues. So for example, what is the transverse transport? What happens if you have couple 1D chains, and now you have a very weak perpendicular hopping, and your particles will be able to hop from one chain to the next, and you want to know the transport in this direction? Uh, is it coherent transport? No, because usually, you will be in a regime where the temperature will be larger than this T prime. In that case, what you're, doing, what you're doing is actually a tunneling experiment. You're having particles which are incoherently hopping from one chain to the next. And this is very different from what you would measure using the Kubo formula. So for example, if you do it between Lattinger liquids, what you find is again a power law of the temperature with an exponent which depends on the Lattinger liquid parameter, which reflects the density of state of single particle excitation in one chain. And because single particle excitation do not exist, this conductivity is a positive power of the temperature. So it goes to zero when the temperature goes to zero. Of course, then you will cross over to a regime where this is not valid. But it means that this perpendicular transport allows you to test whether you get a Fermi liquid or whether you get a Lattinger liquid in whatever unit is very weakly coupled to the rest of the world. And this is something that has been tested in organic conductors, where people measured the transverse uh, transport. So this is rho in a direction where the tunneling is about 10 Kelvin. So this is very, very low uh, value. So they are always in this tunneling uh, approximation. But you see that the transverse transport is either going up, so the resistivity is going up, and then at one point, this is turning down and the resistivity is going on. What is going on? This is coupling planes of couple chains. So above this temperature, the chains are independent and they are behaving as Luttinger liquids. No single particle excitations, you get this power law. And then the chain starts to couple because the tunneling inside the plane is about 100k. So then they start to couple. And this becomes a coherent 2D Lattinger, uh, Fermi liquid with single particle excitations. And bingo, you recover the resistivity of a normal Fermi liquid. So you see that actually this transverse transport is giving you information on the properties of the planes which are perpendicular to the direction C and describe a crossover between a letting a liquid behavior of uncoupled chains to a Fermi liquid behavior of coupled chains. So this is a very useful probe. Uh, there are similar. 
similar things done with optical conductivity. So this is an extremely uh, useful, useful probe. One big question which we don't know, there were many attempts, is the Hall effect. I'm not even talking about the quantum Hall effect or the fractional quantum Hall effect. The stupid plain Hall effect. What is it? It's super difficult. I put a magnetic field, I have my chains, I have a little bit of hopping there, and I want to know what is the transverse voltage here when I pass a current along the chain. I could say piece of cake. Well, not piece of cake, for two reasons. The first one, it's like for thermal transport. It's sensitive to asymmetry across the Fermi surface, which means if you make the Luttinger liquid approximation where you linearize the spectrum, you're dead. You put an artificial particle hole symmetry, your whole effect is zero. Okay, there might be a way to go around this. Uh, I see Michele who looks at me. And there might be a way to go around this. But uh, in first approximation, you need the band curvature. And therefore, you have to go beyond the Luttinger liquid, which means you have to add terms to this Hamiltonian. So then it becomes a little bit nasty. And it means that you have to deal with very complicated perturbation. You have to do perturbation in the perpendicular hopping. You have to do perturbation in the band curvature. You have to do perturbation in the scattering between particles and so on. And this is, uh, this is something which is a little bit uh, painful. So here is a perturbative results that we had for the whole effect as a function of the temperature. So this is very high temperature. And this is temperature at which the hopping between the chains is making the system coherent in the plane. So this is where all our 1D methods fail. One would have to go to 2D uh, description. But in the interval, you see that you get a, a whole effect, which is again a power law of the temperature with an exponent that reflects the Luttinger liquid nature of the chains. And I would love to have a good and generic formula to give you. This is the result of an horrible, horrible perturbation calculation that was worked out by Gladys Leon uh, for her PhD. And this is really a, a, a tour de force to work out this perturbation. And when you have a calculation which is that complicated, you think that there is a better way to do it. But we don't know. So we have to go the, the brutal way. But uh, there must be a better way to, to obtain this answer. We cannot receive help from the experiment just for the fun. Uh, here are two experiments done by two extremely respected groups. You notice that the data is quite old. Eh? This is 15 years old, this is 17 years old. Uh, these two groups know very well how to measure. Uh, this is organic conductors, the same one. They find different results, different experimental results. So the same sample, two different geometries, but they should give the same result. So we don't even know what is the what is the right answer? This one seems to show the power law that we were having in mind. This one shows a power, uh, whole effect which is totally flat and independent of the temperature. What is the final result? Your guess is as good as mine. I think our re theoretical result is correct, but uh, uh, still we are, we are. So we also, of course, hope that cold atoms uh, will be able to help us uh, there. Uh, going to ladder physics is, of course, a very natural thing. Ladders are offering a lot of very interesting things. They offer, in a minimal cost, the possibility to put magnetic fields. Uh, and they still leave you with interactions which are uh, treatable by bosonization or numerics or whatever. And therefore, they, they are good extrapolation between one-dimensional physics, but also taking into account part of the two-dimensional physics. So we have embarked on a very serious project uh, of studying ladders uh, in this uh, various situation. This is uh, already something that uh, has been long in the, in the making. Uh, here are some old results that we obtained with Edmond Rignac on a bosonic ladder. And the question at the time was very simple. If I put a magnetic field and I have bosons, it's like a finite size superconductor. OK, do I get Meissner effect or not? After all, I don't have an order parameter. I don't have, a, OK, so do I get Meissner effect or not? So you bosonize, you put uh, the gauge field, you end up again with a nice sine Gordon Hamiltonian. Your sine Gordon, uh, I had a friend who told me I should have copyrighted cosine. I think it's, uh, it's not a bad idea because I use cosine a lot. Uh, so uh, here is what you get. You find that there are two regimes. If the field is very small, then you get indeed two currents which are circulating and counter-propagating on the ladder, just like if it was Meissner effect. 
you know, if you imagine a big superconductor. And then if you increase the magnetic field beyond a certain threshold, you get exactly like in a standard superconductor, a decrease of the penetration because the system starts to form vortices where the field is sort of screened, if you want. These are neutral things, so there is no screening by electromagnetic current, but where the system prefers to form vortices inside the ladder rather than have the current only circulating on the leg. So at the time, it was a completely crazy theory. We had in mind Josephson Junction Array, so maybe this will be tested one time in Josephson Junction Array, but at the time, the people in Josephson Junction, when you were talking to them about doing something like this, they were looking at you and say, qubit, 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 qubit. This is the only thing they could think of. And so this was never tested by Josephson Junction Arrays, but it was tested by, yeah, yeah. No, fortunately, this has changed a little bit. Uh, but this, is, uh, this has been tested in cold atoms, and there were recent experiments in the group of Immanuel Bloch, uh, in, in now, uh, let's say, four years ago, where he realized, uh, his team realized uh, ladders with artificial gauge field, and where he saw very clearly these two phases, the Meissner phase and the screen phase with the vortices. So uh, this is something where uh, uh, clearly cold atoms are bringing uh, the possibility to study this ladder. And I finally arrived to the place I thought I would not arrive in the talk, so I re-emphasize again. Uh, if you want to know what happened with the ladder under a magnetic field, I encourage you to go discuss with Michele uh, Filippone and uh, see his poster. We have a recent work uh, on this, which has been put uh, on archive. Okay, my time is up. I think it's time to conclude and uh, uh, tell, summarize a little bit what I told you. So I just did a, a little tour of the uh, transport in 1D, and if there is a take-home message is that they are very interesting and exotic property of the transport in 1D because of the fractionalization of excitation, because of the uh, various power laws that are existing. Uh, perturbation potential uh, are extremely efficient in changing the transport in 1D or totally inefficient in doing it. So this is much more dramatic reactions than in higher dimensions. This is deeply linked to the collective nature of the excitations. We have for a strict 1D system, now we start having good methods to tackle this problem, analytical but also uh, numerical. And what is more important is that this is really relevant for experimental situations. Few incontinence matter, but now cold atoms are starting to play a big, big role in this, and they are driving us uh, into finding better solution of what we can. And I think the experiment of Jean-Philippe in that respect was really uh, a landmark because uh, this is the first time, you know, it's not reproducing something which is known. This is the first time one can test for uh, predictions that uh, were very difficult to, to test in condensed matter. And of course, there are many, many open questions that I didn't really have time to address. Uh, finite temperature, the couple chains, whole effect, transport of energy, uh, disorder that I didn't mention. And all these questions are clearly a big challenge for the future. And so this is a, a fun field to, to be. So with that, I stop and I thank you for your attention. Mm -hmm.